All right, so let's talk about Aurora. And along the way, I'll, I'll, I'll point out a few different areas where we've seen some limitations of Aurora, but I want to be as fair as possible here. Now, Aurora is ultimately a version of Amazon RDS, right? A relational database service, RDS, right? Now, our Amazon RDS has several different players, MariaDB, Oracle. You, get, you can run a single instance of a database in, in Aurora pretty well. Now, that's just basically running a legacy database on, you know, in, in their infrastructure. That's great. Now, Aurora was really built to kind of help with scale and resilience. And there's really kind of two flavors of this. There's MySQL version of it, and there is a Postgres version of that. Now, there's a couple other variants of AWS Aurora. There's Global Database, um, there's Multimaster, and there's Serverless. We'll talk about each of these variants a little bit later. But I want to talk about the basic architecture of Aurora first under the covers. How does this actually work? Now, again, it takes a little bit to actually get here. Now, Aurora is, this is from them, a cloud-based relational database engine that combines the speed and reliability of high-end commercial databases with the simplicity and cost-effectiveness of open source databases. It is absolutely that. Um, what I feel, if I break it down and I give a simple statement about the architecture, what they've done is they've taken... If you think about a database, there's really three layers. There's the language, there's uh, there's an execution layer, and then there's a storage layer. Um, and any database can really be broken down that, right? What's my API? How do I interact? Is that SQL, right? I think everybody will agree SQL is kind of the lingua franca of relational databases for execution is how do I execute writes and reads? And you know, there's you do you, you do I have a cost-based optimizer in there? I'm looking at queries, right? Because uh, you know, your, your SQL statement actually gets broken down into a whole bunch of sub-transaction statements that are actually happening in the database itself. That's SQL execution. And then ultimately, data gets stored to disk. Uh, and those are really the three layers. Now, what I feel the basic explanation of Aurora is, is they have Postgres and MySQL on top from a language and an execution point of view. But underneath the covers, what they've done is they've created a distributed storage layer. Um, and so from there, uh, that's how they're actually getting this distributed nature. Now, I look at it as kind of this picture on the right hand side. What they have is they have various different endpoints and these endpoints, this write node, this read node, each one of them are instances of if it's MySQL, MySQL, if it's Postgres, they are Postgres. Each one of them are instances. They are running on top of something that is this storage layer that is a collection of machines with, you know, solid state devices. Um, they're spread across multiple AD, AZs, and the data is written six times across all of these different storage devices. And that's how they're actually distributing the data. I'll come back to that in a little bit. The trick here is they have decoupled everything, right? Um, instead of writing locally in this write node, they're writing down to the storage layer. And the storage layer is then writing multiple different times. Instead of reading or finding the node where this data is written, I just ask the storage layer, the storage layer can return. So you kind of think of it as a pool with multiple different execution engines sitting on top of that, right? That, that's kind of the simplest way that I think about this. And that is a distributed storage layer. Now, they're doing some really interesting things at the storage layer. Um, when, when Aurora writes, they're actually doing um, four of six quorum writes. So they're writing data six times across, you know, they'll write it, you know, twice in each AZ. Um, and there, it's an intelligent storage layer. Um, and they actually require four of those six writes to commit before they can actually commit a, uh, a, a transaction, right? Um, they do this and they write it multiple times so they can actually survive the failure of an AZ within a single region, right? Um, because still I have four versions of the six available um, and I can still get a quorum write if two of the three uh, availability zones go down, right? I still have four copies of that data. Um, so I, reads are guaranteed when three writes are written. Um, that's separate than that, right? So writes are four of six, and then reads are guaranteed when you have uh, three. Um, I can say nothing other than this is brilliant. And whoever came up with this, uh, and I'm not sure who it is, I, I really tried to find out the engineer's name um, um, leading into this. And if there's anybody from the, the AWS team on, I, if there's a group of you, I'd love to, to know the names of these guys. because. This is actually pretty brilliant. Um, this is taking open source technology and open source database and re-architecting a layer of it to be distributed so that I can actually gain some really, really huge benefits of it. Um, I, I love it. I, I, you know, as a software engineer, again, it, it's, it's a really unique approach to thinking about a difficult problem. It addresses both scale and resilience. However, 
I feel it's limited in that it's really tied to a single region. Now, they've done some things around global database, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute in terms of how you can actually get multi-region um, Aurora. But but you know, let's just let's just go through each one of these things. So let's talk about scale and resilience, right? So. In order to scale uh, one of these instances, you want more reads? Well, you just simply add more Postgres instances, endpoints, basically, on top of the storage layer. It's great, right? It's pretty simple, right? If a node fails, if a read node fails, fine. Just load balance and go ask a different, um, you know, go ask a different endpoint. And it's still going to have this data. The data pool is still all there, right? And so from a scale resilience point of view, for reads, it's, it's pretty good architecture. Now, Let's, this is where I'm going to start to get into some issues um, with Aurora from what I see. So let's talk about writes. So if you want to scale writes, actually you're limited. You are limited to a single endpoint for writes. All writes in Aurora need to go through a single endpoint. And what we've seen with, with several of our customers, we've seen customers actually shift from Aurora to Cockroach because of this problem. It, it ends up being a bottleneck. You can, it's, it's like a single instance of a database. You can only scale as hard or as high vertically as as, as, as that server can, right? The, the hardware can, because you can't have multiple write nodes. You can't scale horizontally for writes. And that is a big limitation um, for Aurora. Now, we're gonna talk about this in terms of global database as well, which is actually pretty important as well. Um, and then resilience for writes. Well, so what happens if, uh, if the write node fails, what happens is it takes a read node, it's smart enough to actually take a read node, spin it down, and recycle it back up as a write instance. And so in terms of what's going on until that write node comes back, you basically have a few seconds between the spin down of that read node and the and the coming back as a write node. So you can imagine this, this second node here would come back as, you know, spin it down and come back, right? And so um, there is RPO, there's, it, I think it takes, I, some of the documentation, it's hard to tear. I think it's a five to 10 second um, uh, downtime for RPO for writes. And so that's a, another kind of place where there, there is some concern. You may miss some transactions in that time frame. So, um, so that's a little bit about basic Aurora from a scale and resilience uh, point of view. Now let's talk about transactional consistency. Since Aurora is just simply using MySQL or Postgres on top of it, well, it just adopts all of the same settings that you would have for isolation be it read committed or serializable or whatever you want to do in that database. And by default, it is set to read committed. Now, look at, I was a developer. I never thought about isolation levels in a database. It's just not something that I think about. I don't think many developers think about this. I have a couple on the phone that have told me that they don't never thought about this. So by default, you are set to read committed. If you want to guarantee transactions, you should set that to serializable. Um, and then in read committed, you almost, you're just getting snapshot isolation. So possible issues with that, um, there's lots of data issues. We actually have an old webinar that talks about data issues uh, that are that are associated with isolation levels, non-repeatable reads, phantom reads. You know, you're reading something that wasn't there. Um, under heavy load, however, um, tracking of serialized of of serializable transactions can be exhaustive. This is just a memory pool limit in Postgres. It's a configuration thing, um, and actually can kind of tire out in that single write endpoint, right? And then there's another one that we actually ran into. And again, I'm going to talk about this later. Benchmarking and running tests. I feel like I could sit here and tell you all day long about um, you know, what our team and you know, our, our member of my team, Sean, ran on these things. But when we were actually testing ourselves versus Aurora from a TPCC with a 10,000 warehouse workload, um, there was a whole lot of, uh, the, the entire database seized up once we introduced any sort of workload contention. So if you're familiar with that benchmark, go ahead and try to run it and, and check out the workload contention um, uh, issues that, that we, we have seen within our own tests. I, I, I know people get around these things somehow. I'm not a database expert, so we'll go there as well, okay? So now let's talk about Aurora as a global database, right? Now, what they did is a few years back, I think about two or three years ago, yeah, it was two years ago, um, the team introduced this, this new version. And what it did basically is it said, hey, look, at, I want to in introduce additional endpoints in additional regions so that I can actually reduce the latency it takes for people to access data. Because if I had deployed a version of Aurora and it was just in, you know, US West, well, if I have a person in Singapore and England and all of it, like, they've all got to go to US West to get that data and, and you can't beat the speed of light. And so they wanted to actually address some of these things around um, dealing with, you know, access to data. 
Now, what happens here is you have data is still being written in one region and then synchronized out to other secondary clusters or secondary instances of Aurora. Initially, this was just what you only able to have one secondary, but they have since changed that over the last year or so where they can have multiple different, I forget how many it is. It is limited to, I think, five or 15, I think maybe, or it's, I think it's 15 read instances. Regardless, you can cover fairly the planet with this. There, there, there's some issues here though as well. And I use the word global here because honestly, I don't think this really addresses a lot of the global concerns that we see with our customers and the reason we built Cockroach, right? So let's think about it from a scale point of view. Um, it still has some issues, right? So as you use asynchronous replication from you know, the, the primary out to all the secondaries, there is a delay. There is reason to have eventually consistent, right? So there is reason, there, there is going to be some eventually consistency because look, when I write in one memory pool of storage, it's not instantly written all over the place. There is going to be some sort of delay. So you will have inconsistent transactions at moments. Um, and then also this doesn't solve the write latency issue. You still have a single bottleneck, single endpoint that is a write. So if I'm writing data and I'm in England and I'm in Singapore and I'm on the West Coast, I'm still dealing with the, with the speed of light issue, um, of which actually is significant, especially when you're doing complex transactions. If the, you know, the, the round trip between say Singapore and LA is hundred milliseconds, you're going back and forth a couple of times, you know, there is a delay in that and it can cause issues uh, in, in applications. Now let's talk about resilience a little bit. Um, uh, let's, uh, about failure of region. Um, now let's talk about resilience. So, one of the other reasons they introduce global data is they want to be able to have a failover from, you know, a, a, a regional failure. Now, what happens is what they do is they, since the storage layer is actually done, you know, they can actually fail a region, the entire thing can come down. And what happens is the secondary region will be promoted as primary and one of these nodes will be promoted to a right. Now, this takes time. Um, it's well over a minute for this to actually rebound and come back. Um, and still you're gonna have issues with writes because you're still going through one single place. Um, now let's talk about how you recover from this because it's one thing that there's a failure of a region, right? And so once the primary goes down and the secondary comes back up, how do you actually make sure that the two regions are correct? Now you have a layer of storage that maybe you've recovered on one side and the layer of storage on the other side you now have to remediate the differences between these two things, or you're gonna take that entire storage layer and move it into the primary. Now that's expensive because now you're dealing with movement of data costs between regions. And so typically what'll happen, you need to remediate the differences between these things. So depending on how long it's been out, you have a fairly difficult um, situation to get that actually the primary that went down back up, right? And so that's, a, that's typically an issue that, that we see in customers as well. And, and a big problem, regional failures happen. We've seen it a lot over the past couple months, y'all. So um, these things happen, everything fails, right? Um, so then let's talk about compliance. And, and I bring this up, I don't think a lot of people think about this, um, but we do a lot here at Cockroach Labs. Uh, you know, we, we built a feature called geopartitioning, which allows you to tie data to a particular location based on some data within that, that row. So if I want all German records to live in German servers, I can do that. And I'll show you a little bit of that a little bit later. Um, you know, when you do this with your application, there's a lot of privacy regulations that, that require you to do this. You know, we do it because we like to break down latencies. Um, you know, we like to have, have data live closest to users. Um, maybe I don't want to incur, uh, you know, this egress cost of, of the asynchronous replication. Can it just live in a region where I need it, so I don't have to actually pay for it to actually propagate to all the other regions, right? Get pretty expensive when you start thinking about how large that storage layer gets, right? So ultimately, there is no capability within Aurora to tie data to a location that I'm aware of. I believe that if you want to do that, it's at the application layer. And again, if somebody wants to tell me in chat or QA, happy happy to answer that. So um, again, really, really difficult. And then. If you do want to comply with regulations, well, you need to set up a, an instance. So, you know, all the endpoints, each one of these things, these stovepipes within each region. And then you're ultimately just managing different databases. So really what have you gained, right? You're, you're now have this complex, you know, different 
instances in different places. How do you remediate that? How do you bring stuff together to do, well, I don't know, science in it? How do you do end of day queries across all of them? Like the complexities of running multiple databases in multiple different regions, I think we're all pretty well aware of that just from a you know, resource point of view and then you know, how you deal with that. We think a bit of differently, and, and we'll talk about that. We just think of the, the database running all over the place as a single logical database and let the database deal where, with, with where data lives, right? And so again, I, I, there's costs here, there's, there's privacy regulations, and that can actually lead to costs. Some of these, te some of these regulations like GDPR have teeth, um, and so that can actually get pretty difficult too. Um, and then finally, the, the cost of just replicating data between each of these regions can escalate pretty quickly. If you think about how large your storage layer is, especially as you're writing data uh, six times in each in each one of these instances. And so, um, look, at, this is going to be something that I think everybody needs to think about. I think as we become more cloud native and as we think about data living all over the planet, I think we all need to get much more efficient and intelligent about where data lives and and how we move it around, right? Egress costs are no joke, right? And they can actually escalate pretty quickly based on what you're trying to do. And so uh, I think this is, a, this is definitely something to look at as you're, as you're thinking through um, Aurora Global Database as well. All right, so I talked about the basic Aurora. I talked about uh, Aurora Global Database. Let's talk a little bit about Aurora Multimaster. And I only have one slide here. And, you know, the, the knock that I had before, be, that I had on, on basic Aurora was that, you know, this single write node and it's a bottleneck and it's a stovepipe and that, you know, that, that's kind of a difficult. You can only scale it as high as you can go with server that it actually runs on, right? And so um, Aurora and the team introduced something called Multimaster. It was, I believe, last year at reInvent. It was a beta feature. It is out there and available. I think it's still pretty limited in terms of what you can do with it. Um, in terms of what will run underneath it. But the, the the limitations that I see are tremendous. It takes away all the value of Aurora. I think they, they designed it for only certain workloads um, that, that aren't gonna scale reads, but just writes. And honestly, it really is limited because you can definitely only run in, in, in a single region. So you're still dealing with latencies across the planet if you wanna do that, right? Um, and then if you implement Multimaster, you can only have two write endpoints on top of this distributed storage layer. You cannot have anything else. You can't have three writes. You can't have four. From what I understand, and if there's somebody from the AWS team, please tell me. And then you cannot have any of these read uh, endpoints as well. And so you basically, what's on this picture is exactly what you're going to get. It, it, it's, it's two write endpoints, and that's it. Um, still pretty limited. Um, from what I understand, the consistency between the two uh, um, right endpoints is is good. I think you can still get serializable. From what I understand, I'm I'm again, if somebody has uh, some insight into how they've implemented the consistency model um, for isolation of transactions across these two uh, right masters, I would love to see it. it. the The presentations and stuff at reInvent aren't that great in explaining how they've actually implemented that. I mean, we could go through the transactional model in Cockroach. It's in Go read the life of a transaction in our docs pages. It, it goes through intricate detail how we've actually implemented this. And uh, it's, it's pretty cool stuff, actually, from a software engineering point of view. Again, every time I talk externally, I talk about our docs team. And, and, and our docs are, are extremely valuable. So please go check them out. Pretty awesome stuff. So. Yeah.